<laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson. I'm the uh, president and the founder and publisher of BlackMenInAmerica.com. I'm going to introduce our host. He's the 2020 NABJ Pioneer Award winner. Mr. Harold Bell, native Washingtonian, walking sports legend, 24-7, 365. Over to you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, looking for an exciting show today. And uh, Gary is our facilitator. Uh, Gary is the CEO of BlackMenInAmerica.com. Out of 500 Black websites on the internet, BlackMenInAmerica.com can be found in the top 10. He's also has been connected with law enforcement. He has a law enforcement background. Uh, his latest hat <laughs> that I found out, <laughs> I was wondering why Hattie's food was tasting so good, you know? And I'm saying, Hattie, what you doing? She wasn't saying nothing. One day I came in the room, she was calling Gary. I said, Gary, I need another order of your, of your uh, master chef. Uh, oh, that's I looked up in the can of this season, man. But guys, I was like, I must, I must say, man, it has really, I mean, made eating worthwhile. You know, we don't like Hattie don't like to cook anymore. And I don't blame her. So, you know, when she does cook, she, she puts your organic season in there. Thank you very much, my brother. I find ways to introduce, I find ways to reinvent myself. So I started <laughs> Master Chef Gary launched about two years ago. All right, okay. Uh, our next uh, team member is uh, Chris Johnson, a.k.a. CJ. He is our in-house youth voice. He is all things political and all things sports. He's also a talented musician and the leader of his own band, The Cortland Experience. Also on, on the team is uh, my dear friend, Jackie Jones. She is a former reporter for the Mutual Broadcasting Network former writer for the Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, and New York Newsday. And she is the producer, was the producer of the original Inside Sports Talk Show. She is currently the assistant dean of the School of Communications, <clears throat> excuse me, at Morgan State University. Rounding out the team, I don't see if she's here, that one, uh, Monita may be off today, and Jackie is all. So right now, Gary, I'm ready for you to hit the video and we'll come back and introduce our special guests. <clears throat> All right, let's go. Do you know how strong you have to be to make a black woman smile? Do you have any idea what an accomplishment that is? She is born the weight of this country on her back for her dreams. No sound? You can hear it slightly in the background. You got to take it up. Okay. It's as loud as it can get. Is that right? How about now? No, it's fading out. Fading out. Because she has cultivated in her way the marvel of the universe, only to have her hopes and dreams. It's loud as much as it can be up here. I'll tell you what, what? <laughs> since we have we we have the man of, of the owl in the house, he can come in and, and do it himself live. So let's go back. Let's go back so I can introduce uh my, my special guest. And uh those of you who should have um uh, has seen uh, what this guy is all about. He is an internationally renowned author, lecturer, and two-time spoken word, Billboard award-winning recording artist. He is known for his prolific works, such as Breath of My Ancestors, A Black Woman's Smile, which we were just trying to hear, The Hurricane. Uh, he works tireless to restore the heritage of Africans in America. Uh, his incredible phoenix-like rise from drug addiction and incarceration to menstrual storytelling. He confronts issues of racism and bigotry with poet uh, compassion. A dramatic storytelling and his historic facts make his work extraordinary, as uh, stated by critically acclaimed poet 
Dr. Nikki Giovanni. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome my friend, uh, uh, Ty Gray L. How you doing, Ty? I'm good. I'm good. HB, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate you, man. Uh, once again, you're tirelessly working in the community trying to help, help us get better. So oh, I'm, I'm honored to be here, brother. Ty, um, look, man, we're honored to uh, have you here. You know, a lot of folks are not aware. Uh, some of you were at the, the Miracle Theater uh, in 2019 in November. But I gave you the Muhammad Ali and... Uh, Harold Bell, and I asked Ty to do a poem, which we will run at the end of the show. Thank you, Muhammad Ali. Ty, tell us about, you know, where you came from, and how did you get to where you are, Ty? Oh, man. Well, uh, uh, historically, um, for any of the historians uh, uh, listening to us, uh, I was born and raised in the first all-Black public housing project in the United States. And a lot of people think that's Chicago, Cabrini Green. They think it may be Wayne in Detroit or Huff in Cleveland. But the truth of it is that as a part of Roosevelt's New Deal back in 1933, they, they, they constructed a little place 40 blocks from the White House, 21st and Bennett Road, called Langston Terrace. Wow. Langston Terrace is the first all black public housing project in the entire United States. And that's where I was born. Wow. And um, ironically, so I, I'm thinking it was born, it was named for Langston Hughes because you know he was so famous. But I found out later that it's actually named for John Mercer Langston, mm -hmm. who was the first president of Howard University's law school. So it was named for him, he was born back in the 1800s. And ironically though, I lived directly one flight above the Langston Terrace Library. <laughs> my mother made me read, made me go downstairs in the library and Langston Hughes became my favorite poet. And you know, I would read everybody, man, the, 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 the older guys like Conti Cullen and, uh, Oh, man, this, I, I would just read the, the poets and, and read, you know, I just became an avid reader. And so that's how I became a writer, man. Um, but the long story, there's a whole lot that happened in between that. Uh, historically, I, I, they told me I, I was ineducable when I was in the, uh, the eighth grade over at Brown Junior High. <laughs> and I'm, I'm laughing about it because they didn't, they didn't, label me ineducable because I was not able to think. It's just that I wouldn't come to school. I was a perpetual truant. And they say, this dude is ineducable and put it in my jacket. I'll give you another history, uh, history tidbit. My last homeroom teacher at Brown Junior High was the uh, adorable Roberta Flack. Wow. Yeah. And Mr. she wasn't Stinson, the dog was the Mr. Stinson there? Me. Excuse me. Now, was Mr. Stinson there then? Mr. Stinson, yeah, Mr. Stinson. Right. Yeah. You know Mr. Stinson was there. Well, you know, you come from, you know, you go to Spingarn, right? Uh-huh. Did you go to Spingarn? Yeah, I went to Spingarn in Brown. Yeah, so you know. Yeah, Mr. Stinson yeah. was there. Oh, uh, yeah, man. So, um, yeah, man. Um, That's where, you know, that's where I came from, my humble beginnings. That's how it got started. And um, I've always been, my mother, who my, my dad left when I was three, which was, I write about in my book about how, uh, for some reason, uh, not some reason, I know the reason, racism had removed almost all of the men from our neighborhood. Very few fathers were around. But I, I, re, I, I remember um, growing up there, you know, how, you, you, I, you know, I saw racism firsthand, but because I was growing up in it, I couldn't see it for what it was mm -hmm. until you had to look back and go, oh my God, man, they just, I mean, they robbed our communities of resources and, well, you know the whole story, but, mm -hmm. but um, to answer your question, that, I, that's where I started. I started in, in Langston Terrace at uh, Charles Young Elementary, Brown Junior High. And people don't understand, I've written like four books now, but I never 
actually attended a high school. I, I never was enrolled in one high school. Now I went to Spingarn and Eastern, but I never was enrolled in either one. <laughs> I used to go to the cafeteria, chase the girls and all that. Back then when you could go into schools, you know, you could go into schools and not be enrolled. And, um, but um, it was interesting. It was interesting, man, um, that. I, hey, Ty, I let, me, Ty, Ty, let, let me make one thing clear. A lot of people don't, don't realize this, but Spangon, that hill was the most unique educational hill in America. There's no other hill, educational hill, like that hill in Langston. They had four schools up there, Spingon, Phelps, Charles Young, and Brown. Ty did not have to leave his neighborhood to, to go, you know, to matriculate to all those schools, man. We don't have another uh, school system like that in one place in America. And we're about to lose that because that is going to become condos for the rich white folks. They're going to use Langston Golf Course as a country club. They're going to use the river to go to National uh, Harbor and back and come back home. So Ty came from a very unique neighborhood. Ty, you had some problems after that. You know, you got into the drug thing and, and incarceration. Bring us up to date there, and, and we'll take it from there. Go ahead, Ty. When you mentioned that, I just was talking about how unique that hill was. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was 10 and 11, I used to shag balls for Lee Elder. Mm. Wow. I shag for Lee Elder. Usually when I say shag, people don't know what I'm talking about shag ball. I know what you're talking but about. But <laughs> you get a bucket, he hit the ball out there in practice, and you run around out there and pick the balls up. Mm -hmm. And he pay you at the end of the day. I'm 10 and 11 years old doing that. But um, I, um, I think, so I, I, let, me, let me share a piece with you to kind of explain mm -hmm. how it, 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 it evolved. And I ended up, you know, going through uh, incarceration and drug addiction and all of that because that I remember 1965, there was no drugs in our neighborhood that I knew of. Maybe somebody might have smoked some marijuana, but there was no drugs. But one year later, on every neighborhood, heroin was everywhere. That was 65. And then 20 years later, in every neighborhood, crack cocaine. And I always let people remind people that we didn't manufacture any of that. We uh, all of that stuff was brought into our neighborhoods, and you know, I, you know, I'm not making excuses for usage, but I am giving you reasons for it even being there. So I'm, I'm gonna share this piece, man. Langston Hughes, who's my favorite poet, he wrote a poem called Harlem, and in the poem he says he asked the question. They actually made a film of it. He asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sword and run? Or does it stink like rotten meat and crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Or maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it just explode? What happens to a dream deferred? And later on, Looking back at Langston Terrace and all of the things it presented, I wrote a poem called Deferred Dreams. It's short, but it kind of explains your questions. Mm -hmm. I dreamed of a home where the grass was green. My neighbors were happy and pleasant, but I woke to streets of asphalt so mean only fear and despair were present. My dream was deferred. I dreamt the schools taught children to think and the system encouraged our youth. Upon awakening, curriculums didn't have the missing link and some books taught lies, not truth. Still another deferred dream. I dreamt the crack never entered my hood and the eyes of my people were clear, but I woke to merchants up to no good selling $5 rocks right here. Still another deferred dream. I dreamed King Heroin lost his throne and my folk had regained their pride. But I woke in the projects hooked on bone and my pride was set aside, still another deferred dream. Mm -hmm. I dreamt that murder was a thing of the past and weapons had disappeared 
but I woke to a generation dying fast with gunshots loud and clear, still another deferred dream. Finally, I dreamed it was all a plot and my deferment was contrived. But when I woke, the reward I got was the knowledge I had survived in spite of my deferred dreams. And so I shared that because that's exactly, literally was ha what happened. Mm -hmm. um, he told me that uh, you know I was ineducable. 13 years old, I was introduced to heroin, heroin all over the neighborhood. And, you know, all the people that I aspire to be like, you know, they're nodding, they're doing their thing. So I just gravitated towards it. Um, and then the next thing you know, I'm committing crimes. And um, so for 15 years, man, I was a heroin addict, 15 years. I spent seven years in federal correctional institutions. And, uh, but I can say to you today, on September 25th, 1980, that's the last day they got, they, they tricked me with that. So this September 20th, this September 21st, 25th, 2021, I have 41 years of sobriety. Mm. So- Amen, uh, man, amen. You know, I'm, I'm just mentioning that because, mm. you know, that's the truth, man. That's just how it happened. That was my story. And um, so now my life is spent trying to stop people from having to go through it the way I went through it. And they can, you know, live, you know, because it, it was, it was, it was rough. It was rough, but um, you know, I guess I wouldn't have it any other way because now I am able to minister through, uh, you know, my pain and through my uh, explorations, and and really, that's what it's about, man. Trying to, you know, mm -hmm. give something back. Okay, so I want to, I want to. I want to take this off because we wanted to start out with, uh, of course, uh, a black woman's smile, which has had millions of hits. Not, <laughs> I mean, millions of hits, folks. You know, just that link that I was giving show that was just over a million. But all through those, uh, since he's had this uh, uh, black woman's smile out, is is he has close to twelve million hits. Ty, could you do a, a, a piece of that black woman's smile let me, for us? Let me, yeah, let me let me ask Gary. Hey, Gary, can you just play it and mute it, and I'll try to recite yeah. it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can you do that? CJ, CJ told me that it might work if I use it and put it in full full screen. So I'm gonna try it in full screen. But if not, okay. you just pick up. Okay. You okay. Pick up. So let me go back. This has over millions and millions of hits, folks. Millions of views. Yeah, let me. When, uh, when you go to share it, make sure you have it optimized for um, the video sharing. Uh, let's see. It's a box you can check underneath it when you're screen sharing it. Oh, okay. Let me let me do that. Uh, let's let's go to uh, screen share. And look at the two check boxes underneath. Make sure they're checked, and then try to full screen the video. All right. The two is because one says multiple. Well, let me go into advance and see. Hang on one second. Uh, uh, okay, well, let's let's pull it up and see because we got a backup plan just in case. Uh, so let's go here. Let's go. Hang on, bear with me one second here. Yeah, it shouldn't have to go to any advanced settings. It should be under the basic settings. It just says optimize video. Got it. I got it. Okay, I got it. I think we might be able to to, uh, to pull it off now. So let's see. Let me uh, see. This is where the young man comes in for me. <laughs> uh... Oh, okay. Got it. Let's pull it up, pull it back, and there we go. Do you know how 
how strong you have to be to make a black woman smile? Do you have any idea what an accomplishment that is? Because she has borne the weight of this country on her back for 400 years. She's been carrying the load of America in her belly since its infancy. She has suffered the agony of unassisted, husbandless child since the 1600s. Have you any idea how much strength it takes to put a smile on her face? You need the strength of Samson, the nerve of Joshua, and the courage of David facing Goliath. Because she has cultivated in her womb the marvel of the universe, only to have her hopes and dreams aborted, and her aspirations show up dead on arrival. She's given birth to kings and queens and delivered on her majestic promise, only to see her children kidnapped and sold to a criminal with no respect for her royalty. If you can make a black woman smile, you are a miracle worker. Imagine breastfeeding your child in Virginia, having him snatched from your arms, branded, then hijacked to Louisiana and publicly fondled on a New Orleans auction. If the memory of that pain was locked down in your DNA, would you be smiling? If you breastfed someone else's child only to watch her grow old enough to call you dark, pickaninny, and nappy-headed jigaboo, you wouldn't be smiling either. If you can make a black woman smile, you have done something. If you can make her smile, you are stronger than Atlas, because God knows she has been. She's been raped, ravaged, and scorned, and nearly annihilated. She's been pimped and pummeled and stoned and deliberately depreciated. She has cooked and cleaned and sewn and never been compensated. She's been forced to watch the offspring of her loins mangled and maligned across centuries. Her character has been continuously smeared, assassinated over and over and over again and again and again. You ever thought about how strong you have to be just to be a black woman? She's had to make brick without straw after being stripped of all her customs, all her culture, and all her traditions. No other woman in the history of the civilized world has gone through what she's gone through. No other being on the planet has endured what she has endured. She's been chastised, criticized, demonized and terrorized. She's had to stand when her man was bull ripped for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was castrated for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was hung by his neck for trying to stand. She's had to carry her man because every time he tried to carry himself, he was murdered for trying to do so. Ask Betty Shabazz about Malcolm. Ask Coretta Scott King about Martin. Ask Emmett Till's mother. If you can make a black woman smile, you have achieved something. Since 1619, when we came in chains, the entire world's been messing with her brain, disrespecting her, calling her out of her name. And she's tired, just plain Fanny Lou Hamer tired. Tired of being called B words and H words and N words and other words and everything except the child of God that she is. But the one thing in this world that will make a black woman smile is her man. A real man. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, she will smile. She will smile regularly and gladly. So man up, my brother. Man up and make your woman smile. Treat her like the queen that she is. She deserves it. And recognize this. In all of God's creation, there is nothing more alluring, more appealing, or attractive. Nothing more beautiful. Nothing more charming, more charismatic, or captivating. There's nothing more delightful. Nothing more elegant or exquisite. There's nothing more fascinating. There's nothing more inspiring 
intoxicating or invigorating. There is nothing more magnificent, nothing more lovely than a black woman's smile. Yeah, man. Wow. Oof. Fantastic. Fantastic. Wow. Fantastic, Ty. Wow. Jackie, I'm going to let you start off, uh, kick off the show today with you. That's, uh, <laughs> that's just uh, a powerful stuff. Uh, Ife Williams, who is the president of the National Congress of Black Women, described that as the Black woman's anthem for the 21st century. Wow. And I... And you know, truer words never spoken. How long did it take you to to write that? And and talk a little bit about your writing process. How do you how do you pull these things together? You know, because people think poets just kind of stuff just pops out their head, but it doesn't work quite that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people say that, and I there's some merit to that because. I don't really know where the inspiration comes from. I do know that that particular piece was, uh, you know, I was raised by my mother and my grandmother. And there was, uh, I think I wrote that in 2006. For, okay, the impetus, the reason why I wrote it is because there was, there's a lady by the name of Sadie, uh, Brown, who her husband was the first president of the Black, uh, uh, the first president of the international, Black president of the International Longshoremen's Union out in San Francisco. And they bombed his house. They kidnapped their daughter. They did all kinds of things. And they were doing a program for her. And they asked me to write some sort of tribute to her. And I got to thinking about her, what she been through and where all these black women have gone through over the centuries. And it just kind of bubbles up. If I put a word, if I put a phrase down, then, you know, I, it's, it's, I got to give it to God because I don't know. I, I do believe that my ancestors helped me write. I believe that because I asked them to give me things. So I've, I've also written a bunch of slave narratives. Oh, I got to do a shameless plug, guys. So this book, this book is entitled Breath of My Ancestors, Reflections from the Conscience of an African in, in America. And well, the reason why I call it Breath of My Ancestors is because th it's their stuff that's coming through. And I don't even know that I have any control of it. I, I, I think maybe... I think maybe when I was living in Langston Terrace and all them black books and stuff, they might have come through. Yeah. Got it on my furniture. You got to push it on the speaker. Mute those people, whoever that is. Uh, it, it yeah, speaker and TV. Wait. Yeah, somebody's got it. So, so I, I hope that answers your question, Jack. I, 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 to be honest. Creativity, when I think about people who have creativity, it, it comes from the, the, the spirit inside of them, I guess, the spirit of God. And these voices, you know, I also yeah, write, yeah. I also write yeah. narrative yeah. stories. <laughs> and, and these stories come from some you know, place that I can't even explain. Do you have to do some some research though. I mean, getting the dates and the, the, the background and and how and how do you work that in without disrupting the flow of the writing? Well, yeah, so yeah, well, I did, I forgot the research part. Yes, there's a lot of uh, scholarship that goes into my writing because you you know once you're prompted to do something, then you have to find out where it, where it came from, and so. Yeah, you, um, just, just with that particular piece, you know, I had to research. About <laughs> Fanny Lou, hey, we got a couple parties going on. Oh yeah. man, it's not Sydney. That's not Sydney on it. <laughs> yeah, is it? That's Sydney. That's Sydney. Uh, <laughs> oh I, my God, man, this is good. But um, so, so go ahead, go ahead. 
yeah, it is some, I do have to do some research and some, and some, you know, checking backgrounds and going inside my, myself and, and putting synapses together and putting this, you know, mm -hmm. this story with that story and connecting dots, you know, you know, and, and, and what happens when, with the research is that you just learn more and more, you know, like I, one of the things I write about in this book is the fact that we give all this, all this light and stuff that, and we give all the, the credit to Thomas Edison and Thomas Edison wasn't, wasn't even the inventor. It was a brother, a black man by the name of Lewis Latimer and Thomas Edison get all the credit. And it, it, it happens down through, you know, through the ages. It just keeps happening, happening over and, 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 over, and, over, and over again. Just like, just like um, the legacy of um, Inside Sports. Inside Sports was founded by this black man we sit in the room, but who gives me credit? Mm. ESPN and all them. It's the same thing. That's, our history is replete with that kind of theft of our uh, um, genius, theft of our um, intellect, theft of, theft of our spirituality, theft of our culture. And so I, what I do, I ask the ancestors to help me go back Try to straighten out some of this mess. So, Gary, Gary, yes, sir. Go ahead. You know, um, I was talking with uh, about the whole Muhammad Ali piece and all the stuff that he that you've done, and how you've done it over the years, and how you've been talking about trying to work with the the modern technology. And like, for example, the video that we just saw, yeah, it had 1.3 million views, but we have no idea how many people have forwarded that link. And so we have no idea. And so we were talking about how one person can make a difference. And you start looking at the difference that you've made based on where you've come from. Oh, my goodness. And just listening to you talk about your growing up. Now, I am not. I'm a little younger than you. Roberta Flack was also at my junior high school, Rabot Elementary School. Yeah, I remember when she so. left there. <laughs> I remember when she went. I remember she left Brown and went to Rabot. Yes, yes. And so we had Miss Flack. So, uh, I mean, my goodness. No, but, the, but one person can make a difference. And that's why we do this show. Because you never know how something that we do or say will impact somebody else and how they will forward the link. And that's mm -hmm. the impact that we make. Sydney mm -hmm. Davis. Well, I wanna just encourage everybody that, um, and, and, and I, I think Gary is gonna put something up to let people know, but I, I have a podcast that I just started. As a matter of fact, the flagship episode was just last week and it's called Breath of My Ancestors. Simply Breath of My Ancestors with Ty Grail. I'm doing I'm doing a thing called the Sankofa Monologues, which looks back at our history. Uh, and um, so I just wanted to put that in there because this is uh, what you're doing is what I'm trying to do. We need it. We, we got to inform our people, wake our people up, and we got to remember who we were and, and, and be influenced by our character. Like, um, uh, one of the things I'm fond of saying is that uh, race, I, I, I wrote this little short thing called race, uh, yeah, racism. I wrote a piece called Racism is Dead, but I just want to question everybody to think about this for a second. I, imagine a world where character was king and race was only a verb. Those now renowned who made race a noun would be counted among the absurd. So we got to remember that racism is, 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 is just a monster and we got to do everything we can to combat it uh, because, and that's what you're doing. That's why when you invited me to come on this show, I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, you know I, how far you want me to jump? As a matter of fact, when you jump, I ain't asking how high, when do you want me to come down? <laughs> this, 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 is, this is what I'm, I'm living for. I'm living for that. Over there. Sydney, Sydney Davis. Hey, my brother, how you doing? <laughs> how y'all doing? We're doing fine. I, I, I hear y'all stirring it up. 
<laughs> and of course, you all, you all, what I say is that the truth don't need no evidence. And that's what you all have been talking about. When you talk ancestral stuff, that's not being taught. That's a slice of the pie that has been removed and we've been isolated as a people so that we can get those kind of connection with the enrichment of ideas and doing things that makes us that much more, you know? And so if it's a practice, it has to be practiced amongst the, you know, the third grade, like the brother, what was his name? Dr. Juwanza Unfutu Unfungu. Brother talked about Unfuju. Can't pronounce his name correctly, but he specifically talked about how the system targets young black boys at, from the ages of seven to nine. How they get them to think in ways in which they come against one another, the neighborhood, the families, because that piece is not there. So the pyramid has to not be negotiated. You can't negotiate the pyramid thinking, but it has to be that much more stronger to make us that much more determined because we already know who it is that is orchestrating these things. If you drop drugs in the community, you further metastasize the structure. Drugs and guns a part of the plan, a part of the system, systemic way in which we are being decimated and destroyed. Then the prisons get the money. So the prisons too can be used as an instrument of a think tank to help to, to do uh, that historical piece within the communities where they got trapped. But now they're in prison, they gotta be used with that mind to be able to uplift those in the communities from whence they come and got destroyed. Mm -hmm. And okay. so to God be the glory, the fact is if we don't connect historically, then there's very little we can do about the present because now technology has moved in on, a, on all kinds of things. And it's, I mean, it's good in some instances, but if it's not uh, what makes us more, uh, what makes us demonstrate the power of God's presence, then we, we negotiate that which we uh, have been given. Mm -hmm. And that's the gifts that we have mm -hmm. as black men and women. We negotiate our gifts, we give up the opportunity to uh, empower. You know, we got to be able to concentrate to know that some things are non-negotiable. And that is our culture, our heritage from which we come. The schools take, if the schools take a slice a significant slice of who we are and throw it away, can't get it no more. But those of us who've had these experiences, we've come through things to know some things, to do things different. Can't have the same pattern. We have to change the dynamic of how we relate to each other. And there's no, no system that the, that the opposition can put in place that could be destructive to the black man unless he, unless he negotiates his will his strength, his love for self. Okay. And so we have, we, we have a significant, we have a significant battle on our hands, but it's not insurmountable. It's just that we haven't begun to communicate mm -hmm. about what the process is that will forge us together because once they make it and get a bone in their hand, then that's it. As long as you got that bone, they ain't trying to think about going back so many of our athletes, so many of our politicians, so many of our uh, professors in high school, Mr. Rector, as Carter G. Woodson specifically talks about the miseducation. And what that was, was, you know, you got a degree and you go on your way. You know, you don't forget to, to build the bridge or to put down the seeds that would allow a youngster at eight years old to become a multimillionaire in his thinking, then he he begins to practice that. Okay, Sidney, let's move on to Jacques. We come back to you, there ain't no problem. Jacques, let's come on. We wanna get everybody in here, uh, in the, in the house. Jacques, go ahead. Well, I just wanna say uh, thank you all again for uh, the lively discussion. 
having also uh, Brother Greg been incarcerated myself out in PG County at the age of 17 uh, for an $80 armed robbery uh, that I spent three years in the penitentiary for. I got a GED while I was in there and I promised myself when I got out in 1975, I would never ever go back and be slaved again. And I have not been, and I'm doing all right in this world. And I do try to pass along any wisdom and knowledge and understanding whenever I can uh, to others. Uh, because No Man is an Island, that, that's one of those songs uh, and, and sayings that uh, still rings true today. And sort of what both of you brothers were saying, you know, you got to dig back to history and uh, and you got to keep it relevant. And I'm just, again, I'm glad to be here today and I'm glad to see Ronald Saunders. Please bring him on, Harold Bell. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's, he's a real sports guy. So with that said, I'm going to be quiet and mute my mic. Okay. Uh, Edward Sargent, come on in. We're going to get to everybody. Edward. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Mr. Ty Gray, L. It's really good to meet you virtually. And I just have two uh, expressions to throw out at you. I'm repeating, number one, uh, man up. What does that mean, man up? Specifically, if you give me four examples of what it means when you say man up in that video, a very moving video, a video that's so hard for me to watch. Anytime I see the degradation of our people, it makes me want to do something. It makes me want to do something. And so that's what I'm working on as a writer, what we can do. But for you as a writer, I want to throw that question. What does it mean, man up? And also I saw in your, your video that you had a medallion that had number seven on it. So if you could kind of just pontificate on some of those issues, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great question. Great question. Uh, you say four, four reasons for man up. Uh, well, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, during ch uh, chattel slavery, um, our manhood was attempted, attempted to strip our manhood from us through all kinds of uh, derogatory practices and uh, coming up through chattel slavery and Jim Crow. And, and, and stripping us of our humanity uh, by making us Negroes, which there are no such people. That means there's no such place, no such place as Negroes, no such people. And so when I say man up, one specific is to, to recognize that you are a human man on this earth. And this, the second one would be to, um, uh, coming from where I came from, it's, it's there, there were no men. I mean, literally, man, literally, I mean, I can count the amount of men that fathers, fathers that remained in their homes. And so when I say man up there, I'm talking about accepting your responsibility as a child, as, as, as a producer of children on this earth. That's two, I think. Then the, the, the third one, well, all of them have to do with responsibility just being responsible as a, as a man, because we've been trained out of that now. It's a lot of ramifications to removing the man out of the house. I remember as a child, I'm 69 years old now, but I remember there were man laws where if a woman was on any kind of subsistence, any was taking anything from the government, like food stamps or anything like that, there would be social workers, case workers would actually come around the neighborhood and look to see, to make sure there was no man. Mm -hmm. They would go up under the bed. I remember them coming in the closet, opening the closet, looking to make sure there was no father around. So that was deliberate. There was deliberate. So I got this piece I wrote called, I can't share it now because it's, it's kind of lengthy, but it's called Fatherless by Design. We have been fatherless by design. It was set up that way. So when I say man up, I'm talking about accepting that responsibility, getting back into the house and, and being a man. And I guess the, the, the other one would be to connect with your spiritual father to, you know, under, who, who, whoever created all of this is to try to, is, is to make, make that connection so that you would be grounded and when I'm talking about man up in that particular piece, I'm talking about treating your woman, man. Treating your woman like she is the queen of this earth. 
treating your mother right, your sister right, your aunt, your cousin, your niece, your friend. Treat them right. Do better. All this calling them B words and H words. That's there's no there's no manhood in that. So that's what I what I'm saying. Man up. I hope that kind of addresses. Now about the seven. I wear the number seven, brother, because seven is God's number. Seven is the symbol of perfection. And I wear the seven to keep it in front of me, to remind myself that I'm not perfect, but to strive for it. And I want you to just consider a few things about the seven and why it's considered the number seven. Seven perpetuates our life. Seven is all through everything we do. There are seven seas, seven continents, seven wonders of the world, seven colors in the prismatic scheme. If you go up in the spheres, the atmosphere, atmosphere, stratosphere, seven of those. Go down to the Earth's core, there's seven fathoms. Go down to the Earth's ocean, there's seven, um, uh, there's seven fathoms to the ocean. Go down to the Earth's core, seven layers. You, you, you got seven layers of skin. You got seven holes in your head, um, seven layers of bark on every full grown tree. Um, seven days in a week, seven days in creation. So I wear the seven just because I learned that. I learned those few things. There's just a few things about the number seven. And so that's why I wear it. And to make people like yourself ask me so I can help to educate a few folk. <laughs> now, Chris, we're gonna bring Chris, hold on. I'm going to bring Chris. I want to bring the youngest man uh, on to see before I bring Ronnie. Chris, because uh, I wanted Chris to hear all of this. So maybe... He could learn something from it. Kurt, uh, Chris, uh, tell us uh, what you think about uh, where we are uh, in our history and where we're going. Um, like I said, it's always great to soak up the history from people with a lot more experience than I have. So I'm always grateful to to hear and you know all these great stories, all these great you know experiences. I mean, right now, two two things that really caught my ear: the artist in me has a question, and then the politician in me has a question. The artist question is, uh, you mentioned Langston Hughes. Is, were there any other influences in terms of poets that really shaped your work or your voice and your writing? And my second part of my question is, in terms of criminal justice and um, reform, you talked about you know, how you were um, dealt with um, the inequalities in, in the system when it comes to the drug war, in terms of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine versus um, how um, marijuana was already in the community and not seen as a problem, but these other drugs were brought in these guns and these other elements were brought in were to, to disrupt the community. And what, what do you think about that? Because from my experience, especially down here in Florida, we're having some issues with the Republicans trying to take away medical marijuana and people not realizing that that is not just a medical issue, but that's a racial issue as well. As we get disproportionately criminalized for marijuana as black people and also and, um, for sentencing and for other things. So just um, wanted your th um, to get some of your thoughts on those issues. Um, well, to your first question, yeah, I, I was influenced by a lot of artists, a lot, man. Um, I mentioned uh, Comte Cullen. Look him up, man. Just listen. Just, just, I mean, his poetry is just rhythmic. Claude McKay. Look him up, man. It's just, uh, it's just rhythm in 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 his um in his writings um now paul lawrence dunbar those kind of people and uh, um uh, dr maya angelou nikki giovanni who is a friend um she influenced me amiri baraka former leroy jones ice cold poets and i studied him you know their their their, their words i never was formally trained um any writing that I've ever done has been creative writing because I, I don't, you know, you know, I, I barely can conjugate a verb, to be honest, in terms of literature and, and structure, but I know spirit and I know soul and I, I know rhythm. And so when the words come to all, everything that you hear from me is rhythmic. And the reason why it's rhythmic is because I studied those rhythmic poets with, with, with respect to, um, criminal justice in this whole drug thing, man. It's, 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 it's so diabolical that um, it, it take, you know, it take volumes. As a matter of fact, I've written some stuff on it 
but it's t- it would take volumes of, of writing to un- understand how diabolical this whole process is and, and the various steps that have been taken throughout the throughout with, with, with the different laws and different things that have been put in place politically to keep us enslaved. Because and if you look at any of the drug uh, um, um, insurgencies, when I say drug insurgencies, I mean like in the 60s, in the middle 60s, when there was an insurgence of, of heroin, is when our people started to rise up. We're talking about the uh, civil rights movement in the 60s. Malcolm X was putting people on fire. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, another another guy who, who in, influenced me, um, was Gil Scott Heron. Heron. Um, they, these people were making. They, we 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 were culturally rising up, and we were spiritually rising up, and we were intellectually rising up. And here come the heroin to put the light out to the community. Same thing was happening. In the 80s with hip hop, we started, hip hop started out, wasn't dumbed down with all this N word, B word, all this stuff. It was culturally enriching. People were waking up. You know, people, we, we had people with attitudes and doing different things and making, making uh, cultural statements, political statements, and here comes crack. Put the light out again, numbed it down. So, uh, you know, I, I can go on and on with that because that's been my story. I mean, I, you know, I lived through that. As a matter of fact, I spent uh, four years in Lexington, Kentucky, where I got my GED too, got my GED oh, in Lexington, speak. Kentucky. But that's a drug treatment facility, an experiment where they put all us drug people yeah, in the drug room. Uh, yeah. okay, um, you. you know, I, yeah, you I, I, on I, her. You know, he got it, he got it. Got it. Got it. So Sydney, Sydney and I have been through a cu- in, in a couple of uh, uh, organizations together, or done some things organizationally together um, that speak to those issues. But to your question, I mean, man, where do you start? Where do you stop? It's like, you know what I mean? You know what I'm mean? saying, CJ? It's just so much. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's where I was trying to get at. You know, I'm trying to be on the front lines and, and fight for the, you know, the youth, the 30 and under people who are, have given up so much hope. And they're, they see it, there's, it's a lot of cynicism and it's, it's hard to, to pick up the fight. So I'm, I'm looking for every bit of help and advice to how, how do we keep people motivated to keep fighting? Cause it, it's a lot to fight. As you said, it's a lot of systematic issues that are baked in to the criminal justice system. And it's working as it's, as it's intended, as you alluded to, it's not broken to the people who it's serving, it's broken to us. Yeah. Ronald, Ronald yeah. Sanders, come on in, Ronald. Ronald, you bring Ronald in here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good, good. Well, I appreciate, first of all, Jock inviting me to this um, Zoom meeting. And um, I'm delighted to see Ty. We go way back. I used to be, I lived on 19th Street off of D Street, Northeast, where Tony Heath and Dead Ted Maduro, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> And I'm encouraged by what I heard, man, you know. So, CJ, what you were saying, and man, you brought to light that individuals, like I live in the hood. I live over here in Southeast and Ward 8. And we have a disproportionate amount of individuals that are being killed by our own Black people. And we have, you know, in trying to get them to understand that this violence has to stop because, you know, all we're doing is continuing that process that you spoke of on how well it's not serving us. And with this police reform, there's always concern. I mean, I don't want to take away no police. Um, I, that's the first thing I do is when I have a problem, that's who I'm calling. You understand? And um, But there are some individuals that should never be police. And they're getting away with all kinds of crimes. And we see that every day, especially here in Southeast. Uh, and so we have to look at the whole picture and what can be done to kind of like steer our children away from the crime, the drugs, the, um, I guess you could say is all part of giving back by trying to, you know, teach one, you know, to get them to come along in, in the thought process. Because if not, then the judicial system will continue to work flawlessly as it has been against us. And, you know. 
So I understand what you're saying, and it's and and Jock and Ty, you know, I appreciate all the words that you said, especially about Langston Hughes. You know, I didn't, I knew that it was a Langston that it was named after, but I was with you. I thought it was Langston Hughes as well. Yeah. Well, it's good to say, Ron. I, man, I remember you, man. Yeah. I remember yeah. you. I was like, oh man, it's Ron Sanders, man. I remember, you know, me and Ted. I think Ted is about two years older than I am. But right. um, that's my man, Teddy Maduro, man. Everybody yeah. on here should know the choice for him. Right. Everybody on here. Well, CJ might not well, know the choice. CJ might not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try Anna. Anna Page, are you there? We can just see A up there. Anna, you've been, you've been holding on. Are you out there? Anna? Okay. Anna? Well, let me see. Anna? 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 Got the camera blocked. Yeah, say so every time I try to say that you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Wow, what? I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. But we, but we yeah, can okay. hear you. Go ahead. Go. We can hear you. Go, go ahead. Take a minute. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Here I go. Hey, now I would. I wanted to. Okay. Uh, oh, that's Charles. Like show, all right. Yeah. I like yeah, this show. I think, and I thank the Mo. Uh, no, nah, Mo. I thank the Mo for uh, coming on and uh, educating us about the need and the necessity for our history, right? Uh, I'm reminded of Dr. Uh, Henry Clark, who was a staunch advocate of advocating our history. Uh, I know when I was locked up, I, I remember being in one institution in where it was predominantly white, and I came across uh, one of James Rogers' uh, books, uh, Africa's a Gift to America. And after I read that, I read from Superman to Man, and that just took me to a whole nother area in terms of like broadening my conscience about our people. And I know for a fact that the reason why we're in the state that we're in now is because that they have systematically got us into this mindset that we, you know, and it's kind of crazy because they got us back into a mindset where it, that we, it's not that we don't come from nowhere. Now we come from uh, a place where all our talents is, is wrapped up in some kind of sports, some kind of rap. So, uh, the extent of our uh, our genius is has been marginalized to like where money can be made. So this is this is so this is where they guys at now. They don't have us in the place where we think about being scientists. Uh, they got us in a place where we think about being politicians and then being a part of the uh, problem and not part of the solution. So I appreciate this show, Harold. This is this is very enlightening for the benefit of uh, your listeners, and this is very enlightening for the benefit of myself because. We always have to go back to that place and, and recognize that I, if you go back and you listen to one Nelson Mandela speech, he said, the greatest fear that we have is that we that we recognize our great, that we're great beyond measure. It's not nothing else that when we recognize our greatness beyond measure, then that's when people start fearing us because we recognize who we are. It's, it don't have nothing to do with our reaction will be. It got something to do with them, them thinking that, dang, if these people... All this stuff we did to these people, they gotta be in the mindset of retaliation. But that's not our, that's not us as a people. Us as a people, we've always been a people of, of, of good. We've always been a pe people of love. We've always been a productive people. So thanks for this program. I appreciate it. All right, y'all. Thank you. You know, as we are, I wanna go, I wanna move on because we got there's so many other things that are taking place in our community. We got COVID 19 that's we we approaching 550,000 deaths in America, man. 550,000 people will be dead probably by the end of this month. We got the immigration problem. We got we got floods of people coming in here. We can't even take care of our own people. They got 15,000 kids, man, corralled somewhere and, and gotta gotta put them up and gotta take care of them. You know, we got to stop and think exactly where we are. I was watching a TV last night. I was watching PBS. It was so depressing. They had a program called Race in America. I don't know if you saw it or not. Then they had the black church with, with gates. Man, we are in big trouble. And we're in big trouble because of lack of leadership, man. It's all about grabbing the dollar. And we got to, we got to understand, and we got to support young people like CJ who's got to pick it up. Well, we leave it off, man. He's got to be made aware of exactly where we are. So, you know, all you guys that, that, come, that came today, and including Jackie, fantastic. I, wanna, I want Gary to say uh, something about 
a, a great a man that we just lost, and I'm quite sure all of you know the first black DC police chief who was a real man and, and who cared about his people, Bertel Jefferson. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, chief Jefferson was a friend of my mom's who was a DC cop and he was always in and out of our house as he was coming up the ranks. And uh, we used to uh, go by his house and back and forth. And uh, I know he, they had study sessions to make sure that black officers knew what they needed to know to get up the ladder. And some of those sessions would be in my basement in my home. And, uh, you know, one, one fond story of Chief Jefferson is that I was hanging out on the corner of 5th and Tuckerman Street outside of Coolidge High School. And uh, I should have been in class. And a car rolled up. This is before he was chief. And uh, police officers got out there. I was out there with my buddies. And uh, he looked and he says, aren't you Ernestine Johnson's son, Gary? Come on over here. And he took me and whispered to me. He said, now look, you just follow along here. And they took me and put me in the back of the squad car, put, you know, just like they do criminals, you know, put me in the back. <laughs> oh my goodness. And they pulled off and my buddies were all shaking and they ran back to school. And all he did was drive me around the front and <laughs> told me to get back in school. And, uh, but the next day, and he said he wasn't going to tell my mother, and he didn't. But, man, my street cred was tough when I went in school, man. They said, man, Gary, man, he, he got out, you know. But, uh, <laughs> oh, I had tough street cred that day. But I was scared because I said, he still might call my mother and tell her. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. He was a man of his word, didn't say anything, and I never hooked school again. I said, man, my mother knows too many people. No, I just it's, it's just easier to do right. Yeah, you know, um, I'm telling a little short piece about about Jeff because Jeff was was in my corner all all the way. We became chief. He was attending my Christmas toy parties or whatever I was doing. But I got in I got in a beef down at the Shoreham Hotel. I was doing a thing a rep, uh, uh, paying tribute to the Ohio State football players, uh, Cornelius Green, and I had Woody Hayes there. I had man, you name them. I had Fontroy, Robin Hood, Dave Bing, everybody there. And me and a friend of mine, uh, he got pissed off because when I introduced him, I introduced him without the proper titles that he was used to. And I introduced, and Jim Vance had introduced Coach Hayes as Coach Woody Hayes. So I introduced my friend and didn't use the proper titles. So we went out in, in, in the lobby while we was getting ready for the fashion show. And I'm standing there talking to some folks, man. And, and this buddy of mine comes up, and boy, he was he went all oh, he was a little drunk, but he took his finger and punched it in my head, and I knocked him in the floor. <coughs> and boy, what did I do that for, man? It all oh, hell broke loose. So now I'm lying home in the bed the next morning, and the phone rings, and it's Bertel Jefferson. He said, Harold, what the hell is wrong with you, man? He said, man, will you stay low for about three or four days? <laughs> he, said, he said, because some people try to get you locked up. And that's the kind of guy that he was, man. You know, and me and that individual, he knew he was wrong. And we finally hugged and made up about 10 years later. But that's the kind of guy that Bertel Jefferson was, man. And we lost another um, guy by the name of Marvin Hagner one of the greatest uh, boxers of all time, middleweight, you name it, but a class act and a guy with integrity. I want Jock to take a, a minute and tell us about uh, Marvin Hagler and your relationship with Marvin. I had a chance to meet him because, you know, my brother's a boxing referee. His name's Kenny Chevalier. And uh, just before Ray and Hagler fought, uh, Marvin came out to Ray's uh, restaurant out in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. That's me and my wife and Marvin Hagler. And Marvin's a real nice guy, man, you know, and he was hugging on my wife. And I say, Marvin, please don't hug her too tight because I cannot whip your tail, man, you know. And, and plus, you may have to hit me and I'll become rich. And he starts, so that was our little laugh that we had together, you know, because he's a human being. And I said, I know this dude's a tough boxer, but I'm sorry, you know, he got a sense of humor. And he did, man. And then that's a picture of me and Ray. Ray asked Marvin to take that picture. Uh, again, because, you know, we went to junior high school together, you know, and I'm, I'm half D.C. and half P.G. County. I was born in D.C. in general, and I lived in D.C. until 68, you know, when we got moved to Palmer Park. But uh, Marvin's just a real nice guy, 
very down to earth, man, for someone who's had all that money and fame, you know. And you see how good those, how big those guys are smiling, man. They, you know, they were very genuine, you know, and, and Ray and Marvin both. So I'll say that about both of them. And Marvin, you know, uh, of course, was a married man, had five children. And me, you know, being married and have children myself, that's just something that's really, really close to me. Right. And that's what I'd like to say about it. You know, and as we get out of here, I want to go out of here on a boxing note. As I said, uh, back in 2019, I I did an interview with Muhammad Ali in 1974. Uh, Muhammad Ali came. That was after he uh, knocked out George Foreman in the eighth round, one of the biggest historical fights of all time. And we were in Chicago. I was supposed to go to Zaire with Marvin. I mean, with uh, uh, Ali, but I was scared to fly across the ocean. So I told him, man, I'm not going across no ocean to do an interview with you, man. I I'm scared. So anyway, he made fun of me. So he said, Harold, since you're scared to fly across the ocean, when I knock this sucker out, I'm going to give you the first interview when I get back to the States. I ain't paying no good Marvin, you know, Ali always saying crazy stuff. So I got on the plane, came back to Washington with J.D. Brown. Um, I'm sorry, Rodney Brown, not J.D. Brown. And sure enough, man, five nights after he knocked out Foreman, I'm lying in the bed. And who in the phone rings about 1030 and on up in say, I want to speak to Harold Bell. I said, man, who's calling? He said, I want to speak to Harold Bell. I said, who's calling? He said, fool, this is the heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. I stepped straight in the bed. So anyway, when I did uh, the thing uh, down in the theater, I asked uh, Ty, would he put a piece together uh, that we could run on the screen uh, with uh, uh, Muhammad Ali? And he did a poem, and Gary was there, and maybe Chris was there. I want to run that right now. Go ahead. This is Ty Grayell, and I just want to say thank you, Muhammad. Thank you, Muhammad Ali. Because every single time that we questioned our mortality, the strongest image we could see was that of you, Muhammad Ali. You made our spirits grow when racism said we couldn't and self-doubt said we shouldn't and self-esteem was at an all-time low. You gave us back our pride, put courage back inside. And we love you and we want you to know the way you stood up for yourself gave our whole race wealth, wealth that comes only from the heart. And the way you danced around the ring made our proud hearts sing. And we loved you from the very start. Your extremely handsome face delighted our whole race. And when you spoke, we all just had to smile because with every word you said, we would elevate our heads and gloat for just a little while. And when you said you would not kill, for someone else's thrill and would not war against those not your enemy, you shook up the world, you precious African pearl, and we'll love you straight through infinity. You see, the strength in your resolve helped us all solve problems in our everyday existence because you shouted long and loud, stood up straight and proud, and we flew on the wings of your persistence. So again, thank you, Muhammad. For we are truly honored to have had you in our life and times, and it was you who said it best. Your words still stand the test. You were, you are the greatest of all time. Thank you, Muhammad Ali. Thank you, Ty. Thank you so much. I want to, I just, I just want to say, man, that, that was so great. I'm going to take we got to get out here. I want to take everybody a minute, Sydney. I got to tell Sydney this. We got one minute. Jackie, we're going to start with you and uh, to close out the show. And to, we'll make time the last one uh, to come in here. Jackie, go ahead, Jackie. I just want to say thank you. Your words are, are wonderful. They are uplifting and inspirational. And I just hope that you just keep doing it for a lot, lot longer so more people can hear what you have to say. Okay. All right, let's go to Jacques. Jacques. I am very thankful again for all of the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that I received here and that I'm able to give as well. And I appreciate these strong black men and a beautiful black woman who's strong as well being in the den with all of us. Okay, Ronald. Ronald, you got a minute, Ronald. 
I just want to say thank you for inviting me. And um, I am, I'm glad to see all of y'all here and, and all the words of wisdom that I heard today, too. It means a lot to me. Okay. Edward? Yeah, I have seven words to say. One, two, three, <laughs> five, six, seven. That's all I got to say. <laughs> okay. This is CJ. CJ. Thanks for um, sharing your experience. And um, I'm going to get to those poetry recommendations and jump on some of those authors I'm not uh, as familiar with and get on that. So appreciate it. OK. Gary? Sir, you have a home at blackmeninamerica.com. We'll be talking this week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. OK, Ty, you got to close it out. Well, I, I, ju I just want to re remind us of what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said that um, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's what we have to do. We, we have to learn to love ourselves, to drive out all of these problems. And if we keep loving ourselves and keep educating ourselves, uh, eventually we will get better. I remember when it was a lot worse. I always like to end anything that I do with this quote that I wish I wrote it. I did not write it. Somebody, I don't know who wrote it, but it's just so profound. And it simply says, the past is history. The future is a mystery. But this moment, this very moment is a gift. And that's why it's called the present. I want to thank you, Harold, and everybody else on here for sharing your presence with me. All right. And once again, uh, I want to thank all of you. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know Sydney's probably gone, but you know, Sydney uh, gave me something that I use all the time. He said, truth needs no evidence. And that's what it's all about. Truth needs no evidence, folks. And that's what, you know, that we, that's what we do here on Zoom Sunday. We speak the truth and, and it needs no evidence. It cannot be questioned. They can question it, but really, it needs no evidence. And I want to go out with this, that you cannot soar like an eagle if you're hanging out with chickens. That's going to be it. Until next Sunday at the same time, I'm Harold Bell, and I'm gone. <laughs> Stay safe. Wear your mask. <laughs>